I do a lot of walkthroughs with principals, and you know the kids are always like, "Oh man, who are you?" I like, like you look like the president, or you know, because <laughs> sometimes I'll wear a suit, but they're like, "Oh, you look like the president." Like I never had that, yeah. right? I never had, I never had a principal that was like native. This is High Tech High and Box. I'm Alec Patton, and that was the voice of Peter Deswood, the assistant superintendent of the Central Consolidated School District in northwestern New Mexico. This is one of two interviews with Navajo educators that we're putting out this week. The other is with Bernita Bada, who teaches a bilingual kindergarten class in Navajo and English. I highly recommend listening to both episodes. I spoke with Peter at the 2023 Deeper Learning Conference. We talked about the significance of being an American Indian school leader and the path that took him there. We talked about his experience of education and what he's doing to make sure the kids in his district have a different experience. But we started by talking about exactly where the Central Consolidated School District is and who it serves. So we're in northwestern New Mexico, really close to the Four Corners, a uh, very unique district. So we have three unique communities that we serve. Uh, two of the communities are on the Navajo Reservation. And the third is, I guess, a, a border town. So it's off reservation. Got it. So most of the district is on a reservation. Yes, uh, there's probably 10 mile by 40 mile uh, strip of land that's off the reservation. So 95, 96% of it is on the Navajo Nation. Got it. And how big is the district total? Well, I believe it's about the size of Rhode Island. Wow. So just th- that's just our district. But the, the Navajo Nation, I believe, is this, the size of uh, West Virginia. Okay. Got it. That's big. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty good size. Uh, very, we're very rural. Yeah. Um, in, in two of our communities, Shiprock and then Newcomb area, we actually have teacherages uh, for our staff who work out there in, in those rural areas. You have what? What did you say was the word? Teacherages, like housing for for teachers. Oh, okay. Got yeah. It. Very very different than a lot of places, just because of how remote. Yeah. Our our two areas are. So how many how many schools are in the district? So there are seventeen schools, um, and we serve about five thousand students in three comprehensive high schools, an alternative school, there's a special preschool. There is also f- three middle schools, seven elementary schools. Got it. What's the demographic makeup of the kids? Is it mostly Navajo? kids How's that's that? correct so actually can i do my navajo introduction first? yeah please sorry oh yeah that's okay so got yate uh shay peter does with the third in she uh to cut chin in your slack and the chini bush is chin and she had a shade or toy toy head lean or chanela so i just did my clan introduction i i am navajo uh that's why i asked if uh, if it was being video because you know i'm i'm, I'm brown so but uh, anyway uh, uh, i just want to do my clan introduction because that's how we identify as um as uh, Diné, uh people mm-hmm. um from from the four corners region i am navajo that's why we're talking about uh, our school district uh, just to to provide that context because of the relationship uh based on our four clans and how we identify with um our relatives um i guess it would be kinship uh, but in our in our language, we call that k'e, which is a lot of the principles. Yeah. All right, now, what was your original question? Uh, Sorry. <laughs> I have no idea. It's all right. That was. Oh, oh the demographics. Yeah. Yeah, so um, of the 5,000 students, 94% of our students are Navajo. 100% of our district is, um, I guess, free lunch. Mm-hmm. And I think we have 4%, no, yeah, 4% that are um, Mexican-American. And then, which I think leaves 2% of our students are um, Caucasian right. or, or, or Anglo. And you said, about, you said about the four clans, is that right? So what's, how does that... So the clan system is, my first clan is my mom's clan. So uh, Navajo uh, culture is a matrilineal. So uh, even though my, my, I guess my birth certificate name is uh, patrilineal, that's my dad's name. But uh, traditionally our clans, we, we inherit our mother's clan. So the first clan that I said is my mom's clan. The second clan is my dad's clan. So, and then I also do my maternal and paternal grandfathers. That's mm-hmm. how we identify and that's how we, I, we, we relate with people. So I guess that's part of uh, our tradition and how we try to identify with other people who are Navajo um, so that there's a, 
we have kinship and that's established uh, in the in the beginning when we first meet in fact usually say it like after you shake hands uh, and do a greeting and then uh, people ask oh what, is, what are your clans in Navajo we say Ido uh, like uh, you know what, what are your clans is, is essentially what is being asked by um, doing your giving your clans got it thanks for uh, for you know setting this up uh, so we can talk about talk about our school district and our staff so anybody looking for a job out there I'll do it I'll do a pitch awesome yeah so yeah, yeah. we do have teachers so if anybody's looking for a job we do have competitive wages where does your story as an educator start yeah so actually um, my first language actually Navajo so that was the first language that I uh, um, that I learned and knew and understood uh, part of that was just growing up um, on the reservation um, in Arizona the Navajo reservation covers Arizona, um, Utah, and New Mexico, um, but I was raised in Arizona. Dirt floor Hogan. A Hogan is a traditional dwelling of Navajo people. I had no running water in our in the Hogan that that my mom and dad got married in. Um, so uh, I guess it started from there. It started uh, the community that what I was raised in. My ancestors and my relatives um, uh, investing, I guess, in me. You know, teaching the cultural teachings. I went to uh, various different schools on the reservation, I guess a boarding school in La Cachuca, Arizona. And then, of course, I think when I was about, f- I was in fifth grade, my mom and dad moved us off the reservation to a border town, uh, Farmington, New Mexico. And then I ended up uh, graduating, going to elementary, middle school, and high school there. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, went off to college and, you know, bachelor's, master's, uh, PhD work as well. And when you say border town, which border are you referring to? So I'm talking about when within, I guess, native communities in, in the United States, when people refer to a, a border town, uh, we refer to a border town as a town that borders a reservation. Got it. Uh, so there's a lot of, I guess, racism that exists uh, on those reservations. There's been a big movement in the last three or four years for murdered, missing indigenous uh, relatives. Uh, because uh, a lot of times uh, in these border town communities, um, a lot of our relatives uh, are lost. They're, they're kidnapped, sex trafficked, uh, whatever, mm-hmm. stolen, yeah. um, murdered as well. Uh, so anyway, that's that's what I mean by border town. It's predominantly um, uh, white. So then a lot of times these communities that border reservations, uh, they, they serve as the economic hub for for the indigenous uh, people to go and get their resources uh, food clothing things like that uh, it's, a sh- it's a shopping area for that, that border um, uh, Navajo or an Indian reservation yeah or probably territory as well when did you start teaching yeah, about 20 years ago I actually uh, worked at uh, the Indian Community School in Milwaukee Wisconsin So I've uh, taught urban American Indians uh, from the seven recognized tribes in Wisconsin. Uh, So I was there probably about three years. How'd you end up in Wisconsin? Yeah, so that's a a separate story, but uh, I just ended up there, I guess, followed a path I was supposed to take. And uh, anyway, I I, I actually was... uh, was working as an accountant and uh, actually I was kind of bored and one of my colleagues was like hey you know there's this school right over here by Marquette you should go take a look at it so I went over there and applied and I got hired and I I taught uh, computers and technology I have a a bachelor's in accounting and a minor in MIS so I I taught computer classes and I also taught mathematics so anyway I I was there for about three years I got my teaching credential from uh, the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee and there's a program called Urban American Indian Teacher Training Program was a Department of Education grant. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so anyway, that's how I got into education. There's, I guess, like normal. You know, there's not a lot of males um, in in education. Uh, so that was there was a focus on serving underserved populations, uh, and you know, using equity uh, to to bring people into education. After that, I worked uh, in Tohatchi, uh, New Mexico, which is actually on the Navajo Reservation. So I, I worked there for a couple of years, and then I actually ended up working in a, a town called Farmington, New Mexico, for yeah. about 15 years. And then been a middle school teacher, high school teacher, high school principal, coached every every sport except for wrestling. Well, I coached football, boys basketball, girls basketball, track. I've once coached volleyball. 
You may not want to answer this, but what's your favorite sport to coach? What, basketball? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's probably my favorite sport. Do you think being Navajo, being raised in the community you were raised in, does that inform your approach to education? Yeah, it does. This conference actually helped, had me reflect on this with the journal. I think one of the things was that uh, the education that I saw, uh, many of my educators were, were non-Navajo. Uh, they were they were Anglo uh, in, in, in a Navajo community. Um, and so, you know, I got the mainstream history, right? Like uh, books that that I read, I didn't I didn't see any indigenous authors or people of color uh, as far as authors. Um, I didn't see uh, myself in the curriculum. Uh, so I think I think that kind of made an impact on who I was. In fact, I think that's one thing that's important about a lot of the work that happened or a lot of the, the trainings that I attended was. Uh, you know, getting students to talk about their their trauma and what was going on in their lives. The reason I say that was because once I moved off the reservation and being a, a student of color and being in a school that was 90, 90 plus percent um, Caucasian, and whenever you watch media and, I don't know, 90210, you know, the, those shows back in the 80s, 90s, they're all like, there's very few people of color in there. Like I remember being uh, a middle school student, being ashamed of being a brown, uh, a brown person, uh, because like everyone thought people who were cool were white because that's all they saw on TV. So I think that kind of made an impact on me as a student. So when I went through my t- uh, teacher training program and a lot of the work that's done here at High Tech High and the Deeper Learning Conference is, uh, you know, who we are as people, uh, our identity matters, right? And I think that's one thing that's really nice about um, the deeper learning conferences is getting kids to to not be ashamed of who they are. I mean, it's hard, but like, you know, there's a lot of things that, that people and kids deal with daily. Uh, I think that was actually one of the sessions that I was a part of where we had some, it was actually a student-led uh, a deep dive and they, they talked about their experiences, whether it was gender or, or, or race or, or skin color. Um, but I think that's something that is, is important to bring out, um, especially growing, uh, you know, having living in mainstream. Uh, there's there's a challenge that happens. So I think part of part of my educational um, journey was learning to validate students of color, their their history, um, where they came from, their story as well. So the community that I actually uh, work in right now, Central Consolidated Schools, we're basically three, maybe four, four cultures. Of course, there's Navajo, there's um, there's white culture, there's also uh, our Hispanic culture as well. And then we actually have a significant, uh, maybe about 100 um, Filipino um, students as well. So there's not, I mean, it's diverse, but like there's mainly 94% are, are, are Navajo but what I'm getting at is when I when I worked in uh, in Milwaukee, I like had like students from 30 to 40 different cultural backgrounds. Mm-hmm. So having to learn the uniqueness in each of their cultures, like I learned so much about the Hmong culture uh, when I was in Milwaukee, or Cuban, um, Puerto Rican, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of Latin American um, cultures and the differences between them, and of course the the like the German, the 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 um, Swedish, different communities as well. Uh, but that's one thing I think that was pretty cool is validating and, and learning about your students and where they come from and, um, you know, hearing their voices. Yeah. If you're a teacher, you're teaching a student with a different cultural background to yours, one you're not that familiar with, what's the first step to gain that understanding? Uh, so I think uh, one thing is uh, attending, uh, if you're from that, if you're teaching that community, is to, uh, I guess, immerse yourself in the community, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the different um, culture, the cultural events. I know it, t- it takes time yeah. to, to earn that, but like like I said, I worked in Milwaukee, and, like, I'm, I'm not from Milwaukee, but I immersed myself in the seven indigenous tribes' culture, their, their powwows, their dances, some of their ceremonies, because people like to share, right? Navajo people like to share as well. Um, but getting invited and going attending um, cultural events um, and then, you know, immersing yourself in that culture. Uh, I know, like, whenever, uh, as an adult, I've, I've traveled 
um, quite extensively, and I try to immerse myself in the local culture to get to know like what's going on with people in that area. Uh, so very similar, I think I would take that approach if we have um, teachers who are, are non-Navajo come out to our schools is to try to understand where our students come from. Because yeah. when you immerse yourself in that culture and understand uh, you know, the ebb and flow, the values of that community, people start to respect you. Of course, like learning you know, some words and some of the language uh, you know, to communicate with the elders uh, and, you know, kids and, and, and parents who, who do speak Navajo as well. So I think, I think that would be the approach I would take. Now, a certain number of white teachers are going to be like, well, can I go to a, is it going to be weird if I go to a powwow? Or are people going to feel uncomfortable? Like, white people have a history of going places uninvited mm -hmm. um, and, and expecting to be accommodated. Mm -hmm. And so I think one thing that a lot of teachers are going to be conscious of is like, well, I want to immerse myself in the culture, but I don't want to invite myself to the culture. So, you know what I found, actually, when I worked out in Tohatchee uh, at a Bureau Indian school was um, a lot of the students, you know, you build a relationship with kids, mm -hmm. and then they invite you these, to these cultural events. So if you, like, genuinely care, right, you're there for, in the, for the right reasons, right, your kids will see that, mm -hmm. right, because that's honestly what happened. Like, I was there for the kids, the kids were the priority, and then the students actually are the ones that invited me to like the the sweats when I was in Wisconsin or or tobacco ceremonies uh, so you get in they'll invite you because you know they the students respect you uh, as an adult and as and most importantly as an educator so I think that would be the avenue but of course doing some research right doing research and trying to understand the community uh, you know the region um, but but I mean it, it happens I don't know like there, there's trust that's built Right, so I think once that trust is built, then students will invite um, non-Navajo teachers into into their um, family and, and and religious ceremonies, yeah, cultural ceremonies as well. And thinking back to that middle school Peter, what would you tell him if you could go back and talk to him now? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, I think part of it is uh, building an understanding, right, and. and and putting up like images of, uh, of, of people of color, yeah, you know, that are evident and visual within like your office. Like I see like people of color, I see artwork from a multicultural lens, right? So I think that would help out as well. Um, but I think what I, w what I would tell myself is that, you know, you're, you're, you're a unique person. You're, you have you have a lot of culture. You come from from a group of people that know where they come from, generations and generations and generations and generations. And I'm gonna be honest with you. It, it took me living in Wisconsin to understand the richness that I had in my life, right? Because when I was away, I, I saw I saw um, indigenous uh, native communities who had very little, um, or or who had almost lost their culture. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe how um, tied people are or, or, or are hungry to know where they came from and know about their their names and their language but it made me appreciate that even more but of course I was like a 20 some year old at that time right so but it, it came back full full uh, full swing and full circle and I was like I, I realized you know what I, I did I did have I do have richness I do have mm -hmm. I have a lot, you know. I can understand my my the Navajo language. I can I can speak it. Uh, I can't write it, but <laughs> I can't read it. But but I can when people talk with me, I, I know what they're saying and I can respond back. So I guess there was uh, self actualization, right? Um, there was uh, you know we always try in education we always talk about self efficacy and you know developing that in students well that came back i was like oh my gosh i have really good qualities that i was i was proud to be you know but so i guess to tell myself that like hey just hang in there you're going to go through you know some challenges as far as identity but i mean i guess a lot of kids go through that right they don't know who they are through identity but i mean it, it just took me a little bit longer to to realize uh the gifts that i was blessed with and and I think that's what one thing that's pretty cool about this uh, conference is there's intentionality with uh, um, identity, right? It all starts with who we are as people and where we come from. So I think maybe if someone did that, like, hey, Peter, you come from a really cool background, like very, very unique uh, circumstances, 
right? If a teacher would have said that to me, I would have been like, oh, yeah, I do. So I think, that's the, yeah, I think yeah. that's how I would answer it. And what do you think, what would middle school Peter make of where you are now? You know, uh, considering where I came from, I don't know if I mentioned this, or, but I actually uh, I was going through school and I would get in trouble a lot, um, suspended multiple times. I think I was first suspended in third grade uh, for three days. And for, for what? I, I don't even remember. Fighting, probably fighting. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, I think that's part of it. Like I said, I was, I, I went to school in a, in a border town and, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of racial tensions, a lot of, um, racism towards, uh, towards Navajo people. So I, maybe that's, that was where the aggression was coming from. In addition to, I, I ha- actually had a, I had an IEP when I was going through school, I had an individual, individual education plan. So I, I was a student with, with a disability, I had a specific learning disability in reading and writing in addition to ADHD. So I was battling multiple things in addition to just like <laughs> being a student of color. There was a point in my life, I think I was in like sixth or seventh grade where I was, you know, started to run around with gangs uh, in, in the town. But it took one coach that I had to say, hey, Peter, you should come and join the football team and then get plugged into a, a different system. So I think, you know, that... I don't know. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I think so. Uh, well, no, you didn't. Cause okay. <laughs> it was really interesting. Okay. But I was wondering what that, that middle school. Peter oh, what I would think. Oh yeah. So, oh yeah, that, that's right. So I think like, man, I'd be like, I knew I'd be successful, but like, you know, I, like I feel so as assistant superintendent, I'm like number, number two mm-hmm. in charge, I guess. Uh, and overseeing a thousand employees, six hundred teachers, seventeen schools, I, I I don't know. I just I I knew I would be making an impact somehow. But on this level, to have that exponential impact on five thousand kids each year, gosh, that's that's pretty powerful to do. I mean, like bringing almost sixty educators to this conference so they can see that there's there's a different way to teach kids. We don't have to rely on worksheets, right? That's the impact that um, I guess a person in my position has. I, I bring those tough experiences, like like that trauma that I went through, to this position because you know I always advocate for with for students who have disabilities or or students who um, who come from a different culture, mm-hmm. right? And then like a lot of these kids, they don't they don't get to see people who look like them mm-hmm. in in like sorry about that in sorry. like leadership positions so i think i think with that like there's a lot of power in that because i do a lot of walkthroughs with principals and you know the kids are always like oh man who are you I like like you look like the president or you know because <laughs> sometimes i'll wear a suit but they're like oh you look like the president like i never had that yeah right i never had I never had a principal that was like Native mm-hmm. American. Um, I think going through school, I probably had like three teachers that looked like me, mm-hmm. right? That could understand where I came from. But I think that's it. Like, is is that that's the power of of uh, of the journey that that I guess I've been through because there's power in, in what goes on, you know, as an educator because. Because, like, you think about it, you know, the kids look up to our teachers, right? The kids look up to anybody that's inside the school building. And then, like I said, like, as a principal and then, of course, as an assistant superintendent of a school district. I guess that's what I would tell myself is, just, you know, keep keep going. You know, you, it's everything will all work out, right? It's it's a part of a part of your journey. Uh, just, you know, trust the process, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate to be cliche, but, like... But, you know, just follow your heart and like, you know, it'll, it's, it's going to work out because, you know, if you're, if your heart's in the right place, you'll, you'll get to where you're supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And that was, you brought up one thing in there about the different approaches to education and how you're thinking about that. Because I think one piece of the puzzle that you talked about is what you're learning, mm-hmm. that like you were just not learning about people like you. You weren't learning yeah. the, about the history from a Navajo perspective. The other side of that, though, is how you're learning, and like it would give it would have got you somewhere if you'd had lectures and textbooks that talked about like Navajo people. That would not be nothing, but I also think it wouldn't be the full thing that you needed at that point. So I'm curious about 
in your district, what you've got going on, I mean, you brought all these people out to this conference, obviously, you're obviously thinking about stuff. So what's, I guess the two questions is like, what are you excited about, about what teaching and learning looks like now? And then where are you, where are you aiming for? So let me just take this story back like a couple years. I actually, uh, like I said, I was a high school principal before. And I brought my a staff of six here uh, to this uh, deeper learning conference in 2017. I, and my teachers, after they left here, they were excited about teaching again because, like, oh, we can do we can do project based learning. We can do like they saw different modalities of learning. So then they started implementing. And like, oh, we can do this. Right? They would question, we can do this. Like they they had to be given the okay to to do something different. Um, and part of the is was because uh, my high school was like 75% students of color. So then, our, you know, one of the things we really focused on was, uh, you know, having highly engaging lessons like that we see here, here at uh, the different um, uh, levels of school. So it opened their eyes, right? We, want, we, want, we wanted to uh, broaden our teachers' eyes. That's the vision is, is incorporating, like, project-based learning. Um, in the state of New Mexico, they have this thing that's called a, a graduate profile and capstone. Um, and that kind of guides what we do and actually uh, presented to our school board and, and, our, and our tribal uh, community. But like this is what we want uh, our students to be when they leave. And one of the things that's important about project-based learning is the 21st century skills, the soft skills that students learn uh, by being a part of project-based learning. Uh, so that's kind of where, where this is headed is uh, we do want, um, well, the state of New Mexico actually uh, wants us to have a capstone project, something that students can do. But, you know, it's kind of hard to, to to get your senior year and say, oh, you're going to do a project. But if they're doing it throughout elementary school, middle school, when they get to high school, it's just another project that they're going to mm-hmm. do. That's where I want the district to go. And I know uh, my superintendent is very uh, supportive of the work we're doing because, you know, our whole thing is what's best for kids. And like like the speaker the the keynote said the other day was we we're doing we're here for what's best for kids and i and i strongly believe that this is what's best for kids they need to know who they are right we need to develop self efficacy we need them to believe in the self right and as the educators we're the ones that are 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 nurturing that right we're we're the ones planting the seeds so that they can be an oak tree down the road or apple tree, whatever type of tree they want to be, right? And and the other thing too is as the high school principal that implemented a lot of these things, we saw the kids, the kids were happy. The school was their home. Many of them said it was their home. And they said that it was a family. And that's what I want. And every one of our 17 schools is I want our kids to feel welcome. I want them to be validated. I want them to be accepted. And I want them to excel and be ready for their next steps after high school. That's awesome. All right. <clears throat> Final thing is you are also a podcaster, so I want to give a chance to, to shout out your podcast. Tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, so my podcast is called 21st Century uh, Native American Leaders. You can look on every platform, Spotify. I even have a YouTube channel, just Navajo Podcaster, Peter Deswood. But, uh, well, what I do is I interview um, Native leaders, um, when I was first a principal, I was like, oh my gosh, what are people doing? Like I, I was looking for information and hearing people's journeys to becoming a leader. And so I, I didn't find anything specifically for Native Americans, uh, indigenous people. So then I, I just started it back in 2000, I think 16, I was at a training and I'm like, oh, what if I just start my own podcast? I highlight Native leaders, whether politicians, activists, um, athletes, business people, entrepreneurs as well, mathematicians, scientists, uh, and who are who are more indigenous, and then just highlighting kind of like this. Tell me about your story. Like, how did you get to your position? What were some of the struggles? Because th- that's what I wanted to know was what they had to do to become uh, a leader within their community, or you know, to get to the position that they were at. So essentially, I, I was doing it for myself to hear what people. Um, who are native had to uh, struggle and, and overcome to become a successful leader. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Much appreciated. Yeah, thanks for having me, and uh, we're excited to bring some more educators back uh, next year so that they can see what's going on and what's possible. Hi to Kai Box is hosted and edited by me, Alec Patton. Our theme music is by Brother Herschel. 
Huge thanks to Peter Deswood for this conversation. Check the show notes to find a link to the companion episode to this one, my interview with Bernita Bada, who teaches a bilingual kindergarten class in Navajo and English. We've also posted a link to Peter Deswood's podcast, 21st Century Native Leaders. Make sure you check that out too. Thanks for listening.